Thank you so much. How are you all doing today? Perfect day to be in, uh, inside, right? Not too nice outside. So uh, I'm Dr. Werner Absinger, Program Director of the Sekia Institute for Culinary Education. And thank you so much for being here. And uh, on behalf of the Grand Rapids Community College and the Sekia Institute for Culinary Education, I'd like to welcome you to the West Michigan Food Waste Summit, which is, of course, the capstone event of the West Michigan Food Recovery Council. Uh, let me mention a couple of things about your food and the boxes you're enjoying, or the food that you're enjoying, which is packaged in the boxes. There is uh, containers along the room. Find the red containers for everything biodegradable, which is everything except the plastic cup where your fruit is in. The fruit cup is recyclable. So I hope we did a pretty good job in making everything zero waste. <clears throat> And then I also hope you're enjoying the food. And so I also wanted to comment quickly on how important this work is, not only to current chefs, but also to future chefs, because we, have, we can have a tremendous impact on how we treat our planet, the resources we take from our planet, and future practices on that. So uh, your work will consistently allow us to look at our own practices and consistently strive to implement best practices on what it means to repurpose and recycle food as best as we can. So with that, thank you so much for being here, and I hope you enjoy your afternoon with lineup of speakers. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Epstanger. At this time, I'd like to introduce Executive Director of the Forum, Dan Schoonemaker, who will be talking a bit about today's event, and then we'll kick us off to the rest of it. I'll just make it up. Thank you for coming today. My name is Dan Schoonmaker, again, the Executive Director of the Sustainable Business Forum. Uh, So before we get underway, I want to draw your attention to some sheets that you should have at the table. And if you run out, uh, Cade has some extra over there. Uh, I'd like to introduce our intern, Cade. Uh, also helping today is our program manager, Aaron Baukamp, and then uh, uh, our program assistant, uh, Leanne Leiden, who's at the table today. Uh, before we finish our keynote moving to the first break, I'm hopeful that you can fi fill out the first two questions. We don't need anything lengthy, just uh, a sentence or a thought to capture some impressions before we begin our program today. Uh, essentially, I have two questions for you. One, what do you feel, uh, as we go into this conversation, is the most important issue uh, in terms of our efforts to improve the recovery of surplus food and food waste in the West Michigan area? And two, what is one question you came here today hoping that you would get some information or some answers for? Uh, and then at the end, we'll have a, a discussion exercise in which we break those out a little bit after we've after we absor absorb some no uh, some knowledge pertinent to, uh, pertinent to those issues. Uh, again, as a reminder, if you do leave uh, in either of the uh, either of the breaks coming up, uh, Leanne will have parking passes available avail 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 available for you. Uh, and another pitch for our annual meeting, which is which which is in June. If you haven't been to a Seattle Business Forum event, I hope you enjoy this one, and I hope uh, we see you again next month. Uh, so I wanted to quick start out with uh, an introduction to why we're having this event. So three years ago now, uh, we did a. Uh, a landfill study uh, that was designed to do a characterization of what materials are going into local, uh, into, into local and Michigan landfills and waste energy facilities, essentially to get a picture of what it is we're throwing away. Uh, when we did that, we found that, with the exception of a category we just kind of referred to as miscellaneous inorganics, food waste was the top material that we were currently throwing away, 
And if we want it to forward uh, our mission, Sustainable Business Forum, uh, one of our three strategic fo focus areas was the uh, was the capture and diversion and repurpose of otherwise valuable waste and the reduction and maybe someday elimination of flows to landfills, uh, we knew we needed to kind of start unpacking that issue. So in West Michigan, based on our findings, we estimate that 132,000 tons of food waste is going to local landfills each year. In Southwest Michigan, so the, uh, the area that would run from uh, Kalamazoo to Brigham County within our footprint, it's around 106,000 tons. Together, Michigan Depot has estimated 1. million tons of food waste through its mission waste stream each year. Uh, and again, that's the single largest source of waste material we're currently sending, sending to landfills, waste energy facilities. And if we look at national data and extrapolate that against what we know locally, we believe that grocery operations, commercial, and institutional food service account for roughly half of that, with the other half being uh, a small amount for manufacturing and then the bulk uh, uh, individual residents and citizens. That was interesting to us because commercial institutes for food, food, food service represents a good portion of our membership uh, and our flagship members, just about all of them have uh, some, some, some exposure to food waste. And in fact, that they found that that is one of the more problematic issues that they've had to, they've had to deal with in recent years. So through our efforts, we, did, we realized that there was a need for peer-to-peer -peer education, multidisciplinary networking, technical resources and opportunities for collaboration around the issue of uh, uh, of food waste and recovery of surplus food. So we worked within our membership and a statewide organization called the Michigan Local Food Council Network, which provided a small seed grant to help us put together an initiative uh, that could bring together this, uh, the, the stakeholders that, that would form this council uh, around these five objectives. Uh, so a general improvement of food recovery in West Michigan, promoting a hierarchy of waste reduction, feeding the hungry, feeding animals, compost, renewable energy, define the barriers to food recoveries in our region, establish a community of practice among professionals who are interested in forwarding solutions around this issue, uh, and finally introduce local generators of food waste to higher value recovery options, and then to facilitate collaboration between initiatives like this, which is uh, largely begins from a perspective of the corporate and institutional stakeholder with the many environmental and community health initiatives uh, that uh, are approaching the issue from uh, similar and complementary perspectives. This is a slide that I took from Refed that's, uh, that JD didn't end up using and I thought it was pretty valuable. Uh, just capturing some, uh, some work they did for their, ref their Refed food waste baseline to give you, give you some uh, further context of how large this issue is. Uh, and I think if you're in this room, you've probably at least seen some media reports of the past you know, two, four years uh, that have talked about this. Uh, but they found that you know, 60 million tons of food waste in the US each year. Uh, with uh, a value of approximately $218 billion. Every year, consumers, businesses, and farmers spend $218 billion on food that is never eaten. I do some quick pictures of what that looks like. Uh, and then finally, I, I'm not going to steal too much of JD's thunder, but I know he's going to uh, get, in, get, get into some of this, but not go directly into the uh, uh, to the solutions. Uh, they did a project two years ago, ago now, which they worked it worked with national stakeholders to create a roadmap uh, for how to address this issue. I think it's going to guide some of our work moving forward. And I'll talk about that a little bit later today. Uh, they came up with 27 solutions that could reduce U.S. food waste by 20 percent, which would yield 100 billion dollars at value if they were pursued. And finally. Uh, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker today, J.D. Lindeberg, President of Resource Recycling Systems. Thanks, Daniel. Can you all hear me? Yes, yes. I've got a, I've got a, um, I need the, uh, the hand clicker if I can. Oh, sorry. Right there you go. All right. So um, while they're getting that up, up to speed, I wanted to first of all thank Daniel and, and the rest of the organization for inviting me to be here because this is a lot of fun for me. I really enjoy seeing old faces, but more importantly, seeing new people and seeing new people who are committed to this particular love of mine professionally, which is uh, the recycling recovery of food waste. And um, today I'll have a little bit of a chance to with some background that Daniel provided on Refed, which is a report that we did two or three years ago, uh, rethinking food waste through economic and ec economics, and then there was some other thing that didn't flow very well with D. Um, 
But what it did is it lent a certain amount of insight into the problems that we're dealing with. But today, I'm going to focus very specifically on a couple of things. And part of that <laughs> focus is on how food waste can become new food. And it's become, for me, very much of a, a, a almost a moral or ethical passion. Um, and I'll, I'll lead you through that. But um, it's something that I find sort of very charismatic. Because look at this. We're heading into spring. We're heading into spring. And this process is going to start across the country. And in many cases, it's going to be in our backyards. And I think that that's pretty cool. My tomato plants, my, my, my basil plants went in this, this, this last weekend. I'm kind of living in Mount Pleasant. I'm, I'm risking the, the, the frost a little bit. But I figured, hey, I'd rather trade that off for early, uh, early tomatoes so I can beat this fellow who's my neighbor because we have this competition about who can have the first tomato. So, you know, I'm going to give him some extra plants, but he can't plant them for another three days, so I got a three-day lead on <laughs> But um, all joking aside, this is kind of cool. And, and in my view, the recycling of food waste is way more charismatic than the recycling of these things. How many of you plant things in your backyard or on your decks? Majority, right? How many of you have been to the place where you recycle this stuff? And by recycling it, I mean the factory where it gets shredded and washed and turns into new resins. Not so many, right? It's kind of post-industrial. Whereas the growing of plants in your backyard is personal. And I think that that's a critical component. And that's a theme that we're going we're gonna to revisit throughout this talk today is the fact that it's personal. This is the slide that Daniel didn't use from Refed that I wanted to, wanted to focus on real quickly. Because I, what I want to do is I want to let you all know that many of you are working on all kinds of food waste recovery, right? And starting with reuse, starting with feeding the hungry, even putting it into animal feed is obviously a much better and a much higher use approach to managing food waste than composting or digesting it anaerobically, right? I think we can probably all agree on that. If we have a chance, we have a chance to, to deal with hunger in this country through recovery of food waste, we ought to do that. But the fact of the matter is those high value solutions really only impact about a third of this, a third of this flow of material, right? And my focus then, even though we'll stipulate to the fact that this is better, there's a limit to what we can do there. You can't make a lot of good meals out of banana peels. Three-day-old lettuce that's been sitting around and started to get slimy isn't going to be something anybody wants to eat. We shouldn't expect anybody to do that. So where instead we're going to be doing is over on the solutions that can deal with industrial quantities of material. And what I've spent my time thinking about in the last 15 or 20 years is how do, we, how do we stimulate the investment, the billions of dollars of investment that are necessary to get businesses to do this? And this is a private sector oriented group, right? This is a business forum. And so people are thinking about how do you do this so you make money? How can you borrow against your business ideas so you can get the capital necessary to do this? Because it costs money to do it right. So the piece I like thinking about is, where are we going to deploy the five, or five, 10, 15 billion dollars that's necessary to do this recovery to get to 25 or 50 percent? And that's the thing I'm going to talk about today. So for those of you who quite justifiably are focusing on food waste recovery, food pantry activities, things like that, go for it. Great. Fully supportive, have ideas about that. That's not what this talk is today. Uh, this talk today is about the boring stuff of, of, of getting out there and doing the food waste recovery. So this is going to be in three parts. The first third of the talk is going to be pretty depressing. I'm going to talk about the problem. I'm going to get our arms around the problem. And it's not, a fun, it's not going to be a fun time. Then we're going to talk about some of the amazing parts of composted organic material and what it can do in terms of being part of the solution and why there is some hope to the problems we're talking about in the first part of the discussion. And then finally, we're going to look at some of the uh, critical pieces to making the second part work, 
can't just snap our fingers and have it work. What are the key parts to this? And what have we seen nationally, what have we seen internationally that make these things, make these things a success? So we'll start with the fact that, hey, listen, population is growing, right? And it's mounting up pretty quickly. We think we'll probably get to about 10 billion people in this world by 2050. We're at about 7.5 billion right now. There's some thought that uh, there's, there's sort of a natural carrying capacity. Well, what is carrying capacity? Carrying capacity is the point at which the Earth's resources, uh, fertility, water, um, critical minerals, things like that, start getting to the point where there's not enough for people, all people, to have a suitable lifestyle that is worth living. And you know, we're starting to get off into sort of some you know, issues that become uh, religious, become ethical, things like that. But I think one of the things that would be, uh, that's important, and I think most of us can agree on, is most people want to have a better life, right? And we want to feel like other people have a better life. And so that's part and parcel to the reason that I work on these things, because this carrying capacity is a problem. And feeding people in particular is a problem, because there's lots and lots of people. And there's lots and lots of people in parts of the world where we're not living. I'm living up in Mount Pleasant, um, central Michigan. Lots of farmland, not a high density population. Doesn't look like this, right? Doesn't look like this either. We know we've got issues with variability in drought and rainfall that are, that are more extreme than they were before. And the impact on that is, is that there's, there's substantial erosion, both airborne and waterborne, of topsoil. There are those agronomists national, internationally who think we might have lost as much as a third of our topsoil. That layer of soil that supports the growth of, of, of the vegetable matter that ultimately feeds all of us. And we see, because of, because of uh, variations in rainfall that are very, very clear, um, we see increased uh, loss of fertility and general hopelessness and desperation of the sort you see in a picture like this. But is that exclusive to Asia? Is that exclusive to those parts of the country, parts of the world like Asia and Africa that we think of as having high levels of poverty? No, it's not. And this is a pretty interesting graph that shows that the cost of soil erosion, the cost of soil erosion is actually, in many ways, the worst in North America. Well, why is that and what happens? Mississippi River Basin drains 40% between the Mississippi River and the Missouri, drains 40% of North America, 40% 40, 40 of North America. Crazy. In the US, that's a substantial proportion, 85 plus percent of the uh, breadbasket of the United States, the largest exporter of food in the world. So it's a big deal. And so when we take half an inch of topsoil, and we put it in the waterways, and it drains out into the Mississippi River Basin and ends up in the Gulf of Mexico in an area the size of New Jersey, creating not just a loss of resources there, but problems with fertility of another important food source, the, 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 sea, the, the, the sea life food source, then we know we got a problem. Lately, one of the things that I've also run into is there's another significant part to this, which is the nutrient density of food is declining. So if you, if, you, if you put these things together, you start seeing there's a little bit of a vicious cycle that gets us to a point where we need more food because we have more people. 85% of our arable land is under use, so we can't necessarily go west anymore. Like, like traditionally was part of what, what North American sort of expansionism was about. And recognizing that for whatever reason, probably the um, concentration of processed food, we're getting less nutritional value out of the food we have. Well, we got a problem. All right. Now that I've thoroughly depressed you, where do we go with this? I know, it, I know it's something that bothers me. So let's look at the soil, and let's look at the things that we can potentially do with the resources that we have, with the compostable materials and the waste streams that we have. Well, for starters, the soil is a pretty amazing thing. 
And if you see a cornfield like this, you can think of it as a carbon bank. Well, what does that mean? Well, first of all, first of all, if you, if you assume that a finished compost from an industrial-sized compost facility or your backyard is 50% carbon, you recognize that by applying it to these farm fields, you get a whole bunch of benefits. You get increased fertility. You get sequestered carbon, which is a good thing from the point of view of letting carbon get into the atmosphere. You probably get virtuous cycle kinds of activities where the carbon sequestration actually folds in on itself and grows. There's some, there's, some, there's some research activity going on in Northern California called the Marin Carbon Project that has some really, really exciting results that show that if you were to apply enough compost and it's a measurable amount, it's not an exorbitant amount, you could potentially, you could potentially offset all of the carbon emissions of California, which we all know are immense. You know, the eighth largest world economy by itself. And you get other things like water holding capacity and the ability to grow more corn and things like that. If you want to see it in terms of data, here you are, both on gardens and on fields. What you end up seeing is, is from a control point of view or a tag row perspective, the measurements here were of a composted material. And you can see that you're getting demonstrably better carbon uptake into the, uh, into the fields as well as better till capacity and fertilizer replacement, all of which are good because um, uh, Man-made fertilizer, uh, conventional fertilizers are highly energy intensive, have a very large carbon footprint, and use lots of energy. At the same time, you get really significant nitrogen benefits from the same application. And if you look at the same field with the same farmer with two different outcomes, one a conventional approach and another a compost approach, you see that they get across all sorts of measures better performance. Well, that's pretty amazing. How do we get there? Well, for starters, one of the good news is, is that we're in a better position now with better equipment to actually take advantage of this. Because for a long time, we were prepared from a, an ag equipment perspective you know, to only work with materials that were customarily used. And there's been a lot of development of the ability to do top dressing, um, application of compost, things like that in ways that are now much more efficient and precise. That are, that are appropriate and similar in technological merit to what we see with um, more conventional agriculture. We also have had an increase in really significant uh, customer awareness, personal awareness, and people's belief that this sort of thing works. And again, this plays back on my own personal view that you have to make things tangible for people. Why do you choose to recycle? In my view, having spent 30, 35 years thinking about this both from a food waste perspective and a, and a sort of a standard, a standard recycling process, whether it's, you know, whether it's, you know, I don't mean anything bad about your annual report, but ultimately I hope it'll be recycled after people have read it. Um, recycling conventional materials, you want to have a personal connection to do it. You want to believe that you can make a difference to do it. And personally, I think it's easier to believe that you can make a difference when you see that things are being grown from it and you feel like it's something that you might ultimately eat. But that leads to another problem. It turns out that quality is a really big deal. Do you want to put crappy stuff on your tomatoes and then eat those tomatoes? I don't. I don't. And so when you look at the amount of material that's available, first of all, it's pretty substantial. Daniel, Daniel showed it what it is for southeastern Michigan. This is, this, this is for, this is nationally. And this is pretty relevant, I think, because, you know, what we see here is that there's about 120, 25 million tons of material, or all kinds of organic material, ranging from food waste to yard trimmings uh, to biosolids to, um, to manures that are going um, unrecovered. And I want to be a little careful about this because when you're dealing with such a, a, a wide range of material streams, you get yourself in a situation where I don't want to offend the farmers in the room because they're in many regards managing their manures 
in a, in a, uh, in a responsible way. Um, but the point I want to make is that there's some, there's some more effective means of recovering the fertility value, the N, the K, the P, the C, out of those materials than probably is going on right now. All right? The other point I want to make is, is that we have approximately 125 million tons of this material available every year. Fertilizer use in this country is approximately 55 million tons a year. Again, comparing those two numbers is risky business because they're not the same material. They don't have the same moisture content and whatnot. But the reason I want you to think about that is, is that we're in the right order of magnitude. And by the time you, by the time you actually make the various conversions and connect them to reality, we're not too far off. And the, so the point is, is that we have a fighting chance of taking these, these resources of fertility, resources of soil improvement, redirecting them to the agricultural lands, to our yards, even to our golf courses, to our tomatoes in the back seat, the backyards and things like that, and effectively using them and having enough to really make a difference. That's the part I want you to remember. So this is our food waste. Cade, why don't you show them our food waste here? I stuck my head in here earlier on, and I discovered that most of you are pretty hungry. <laughs> and that there's very, very little remaining sandwiches, and people's apple cores, apple, apples are sitting on the table, and they're not in there, and, and whatnot. But that, but that, and that, is actually sort of one of the examples of where food waste is headed, right? Is that here we are, and we'll talk about this, we'll talk about actually some of the challenges of recycling in a venue like this uh, a little bit later. But that's food waste. And it doesn't look like manure. It doesn't look like yard waste. And it doesn't look like the stuff coming out of Traverse City's cherry processing facility. It looks very different. And it turns itself into, quote, compost. Obviously, this isn't compost. This is material that's going to become compost. But it is a variety of materials in various stages of breakdown. Now, let's start up and define a term or two. How many people are familiar? <coughs> I apologize. <coughs> I got a cold this weekend. Um, how many people are familiar with anaerobic digestion? OK. <coughs> and how would you say anaerobic digestion is related to composting? I would hope the answer that you would use is that anaerobic digestion is a train station on the way to the destination of composting. Because the problem with anaerobic digestion is, is that if you forget that you have an undigested digestate after you've extracted the methane gas, and you've got this remaining material, you're going to have a problem. And that material still has to be stabilized aerobically with oxygen, i.e., when it breaks down, it makes CO2 and carbon, as opposed to anaerobic without oxygen, where it bonds with H's and becomes methane, CH4. The point is, at the end of the day, you're still going to have this unbroken down material that needs to find a home as a soil amendment. And so in my view, it doesn't really matter whether you choose to do one or the other. You can be a wastewater treatment plant operator where they've been doing anaerobic digestion forever, and you still have biosolids at the end of the day. And those biosolids still have organic value, full stop. OK, so the reason I wanted to go there is I don't really care what you do. In the end, you're going to end up with this. It's just going to look a little different after it's gone through anaerobic digestion. You're still going to have this, un, un, you're going to still have this digestate you have to manage. OK, now we get into some of the harder questions. This slide is about contamination, right? And so on the right side, you see obvious contamination, right? Plastic bags. Big issue, really big issue. It's really difficult to collect food waste without putting it in something. And the question is, what do you put it in? My guess is this looks like something of the sort that we have in the bin of compost over here, which is probably a degradable plastic bag, right? Dwayne, you remember the 
degradable plastic bags we had 20 years ago? <sighs> Good point. There you go. But you can. Um, the truth of it is, is that was a problem 20 years ago. The technology now, though, is a lot better. It breaks down, but the fundamental problem continues to be the same. And I'm going I'm to I'm first stipulate by saying the goals of doing a zero waste event like the one we're sitting at today, and this was, this was actually great, that that's what's going on. And, and what I want to do is I want to talk about the problems associated with a zero waste event like the one we are today without saying it was a bad idea, because it isn't. It was a great idea. And, and, and to the Secchia Institute and um, the forum here, great. Let's go for it. Let's keep doing it. But what I want to do is have an honest conversation of what the problems are so that people like you can have the insight to say, here's how we have to mitigate those problems. So how do you, so, so let's look at this. Let's also look at the things in front of us. You got this, right? It's kind of cool, right? It's, it's biodegradable. You know, it's, 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 it's certified compostable. Are there composters in the, opera, in, the, in the room here? How does this go through your system? Right. That's right. And that's a fairly standard approach. Is it compostable? Absolutely it's compostable. But what he said is perfect. In his system, it doesn't work great, all right? It's composted very nicely in the lab. Now, I, I believe the, the, these approaches, I still believe that they're essential to getting recovery of food waste at high levels in, in places like this, or in Van Andel Arena, or at, at um, Michigan State's basketball venue, or Chrysler Arena at University of Michigan. Why is that? That's because you can control your system. You can say to your vendors, only buy certifiably compostable or biodegradable um, food packaging material so that at the end of the day, when everybody throws in their napkins and their half-eaten hot dogs and their soggy ketchup-laden fries, and they all end up in that bin over there, and they weren't nearly as good at cleaning their plate as you all have been, that that then can go to a composting facility. And that's a really cool model. It's really nice. The problem is you have to match it up with a system that can actually manage this stuff. OK? Because I can tell you that if I get compost that has pieces of this in it, and I don't see the little green thing that says world-centric, certifiably biodegradable, I'm not going to want this on my tomatoes. Because I personally can't tell whether this is degradable or not degradable. This might be plastic. So there's a perception problem that we have to manage. Doesn't mean it's not manageable. But it means collectively, as business owners, as, as, as managers of institutional um, uh, uh, food, or, uh, um, food supply organizations, or composters, or, or zero waste people, we have to think that through. Because the perception of contamination that comes from degradable food waste stuff is still a real issue that we need to get over. Doesn't mean it's not soluble. Doesn't mean it can't be done. But it's not just as easy as saying, hey, it's biodegradable. I sold you a nice cup, and let's walk away. Because that doesn't work that way. You've got to redefine in industrial facilities. Well, you know, I would, yeah, an industrial facility. But, but I would say. You know, that means everything except your backyard. You know, an industrial facility is something that is, is, is you know, four or 5,000 tons a year. You should expect that it, it breaks down in a setting like that. OK, industrial facilities. Here we go. Industrial facility is probably not a windrow composting facility that is designed for grass clippings. Instead, it's probably something that looks like this, which is an aerated static pile. You can see this particular version of it has, has, has um, concrete walls on each side, has sparging units and air ducts at the bottom. People move them in and out. They control the temperatures very closely. They control all the most, moisture contents very, very closely. And when they do that, they can manage odors. Okay? 
that's not an insignificant investment. That's many millions of dollars. <coughs> this is the anaerobic digester, also many, many millions of dollars. This happens to be at UC Davis. But ultimately, the result is the same. We come out with something that looks pretty good. Do you see any white flecks of plastic? Do you see any of those residuals? No, you don't. You've controlled the system. There's lots of different technologies here that are available from inside, outside, et cetera. But the bottom line is somebody paid attention to the process, somebody thought through this carefully, and somebody paid, you know, was, was very careful about ultimate quality. Now, you can deal with contamination. It is possible to deal with contamination. What you have to do is spend millions of dollars on something here that looks like, oh, interrupting myself. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, you know, even, even a, dent, a dented deck like this for processing, for, for, for screening out flecks of plastic is, is three or four million dollars. But it is possible then to take this pile and turn it into this pile, all of which is a good sign. And finally, it's possible to do something where you can grow your own peppers and tomatoes and feel good about eating it. All right, so how do we get there? How do we make this a viable business? A friend of mine in the business, Tim O'Neill from Engineered Composting Services, ECS, as part of his um, uh, aerated windrow design practice, and he's built a lot of the big facilities across the country, and he's worked with a lot of the successful composters. Now, one of the things that I want to, want to, I want to, I want to communicate effectively here is that you shouldn't confuse the composting infrastructure with the recycling infrastructure. The recycling infrastructure, there's 500 material recovery facilities. 80-plus um, percent of the country's population has access to a recycling program. Um, most all of the material is headed to market, et cetera, et cetera. On the composting side, it's much, much more patchwork. What's available in West Michigan isn't available in Southeastern Michigan, isn't available in Northeastern, Northern Michigan. What's available in California is not available in, in, in Arkansas, okay? But throughout this, there are probably a dozen really successful business people who figured out how to do this and make money doing it. And they are not all in New York or California. Some of them are in Colorado or Missouri. Some of them are in Minnesota or Florida or Texas, or, or Georgia. And what we've discovered through the effort of my, uh, my friend Tim is that if you look at the facilities and you, and you look at the quality of the material that they put out, and you determine that by looking at their income statements and saying they derive more than 95% of their revenue from tip fees, that money that people pay to dump the material at their facility is the tip fee as opposed to product sales, you see a very strong correlation between high profitability operations and low dependency on tip fee. So what does that tell us? That tells us that they're focusing on quality in and quality out 100% of the time. And that's what differentiates them from the unsuccessful composters who are always on the, on, on the, on the bare edge of uh, breaking even, OK? Well, how does that work? Well, interestingly, it turns out that if you have high quality material and you put yourself up against conventional fertilization, um, carbon amendment, soil amendment, and fungicidal uh, um, application, it turns out that if you use compost in one particular example, you know, it's not going to be the same number for each example, you see that this is the, uh, the use of compost is about a third of the price of the same conventional product, set of products that you might otherwise have. And I don't mean that you don't need to study the numbers. All I want you to do is look at the comparison there. The point here is, is that people who are using this as the end market are making a lot of money. And this is applications per 1,000 square feet. There's 43,000 square feet in an acre. This is 1,000 feet. And so if you, if you take this and you multiply it by 43, 
There's big money to be saved per acre on an annual basis. Consequently, people who focus on preparing high, high quality material can um, make a nice business out of it. And that's important because that's why you can convince banks to lend you the billions of dollars necessary to build the infrastructure to make this all work. And so it folds back on itself. Now, this doesn't fit very well with my presentation, but it fits pretty well with what Dr. Oxinger had to say about the um, food industry's interest in this food waste recovery as well. And that is, is that uh, last conference I was at, I had an opportunity to hear from um, the president of the J JBF Impact. <coughs> JBF is the James Beard Foundation, obviously a well-known chef. And they're making one of their four impact areas food waste recovery within the kitchen, both from a prevention and reuse and also um, composting and recovery perspective. The key part here, again, is this is yet another example of the charismatic aspects of training chefs and people within the local food movement, within the foodie movement, to recognize the recovery of food waste and the prevention of food waste is just another part of the social commitment that they have to moving this issue forward and to, and to making food a centerpiece in our communities. And I find, personally find it really exciting that the new chefs that are being trained here and at, and at, and at the bigger name, in the bigger name um, training locations are all now starting to get uh, a background in what do we do to make better use of the food that we have, make sure there's less waste, and understand the social and economic reasons for doing that. I find that very exciting. Which brings us back to the first point I made, which is, this is pretty amazing stuff. And we need to have a high enough quality material and a high enough qu quantity of recovery to make it possible that we can still have a bounty like this 50, 60, 100 years from now. I kind of like this, but I didn't think the punchline was great, right? Because I think in this particular case, it will kill us if we don't compost. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, and I think we have a little bit of time to we have a little bit of time for Q and A. I'd be happy to help lead a discussion. Um, I certainly don't think I have all the answers, but there's 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 plenty of resources available to find those answers if necessary. If you would raise your hand if you have a question, I'll bring you a mic. We have an L-shaped room with about 130, 150 people in it. So in order for everybody to hear your question, I will bring you a microphone. Sorry. Thank you very much for what you're doing. Um, in regards to contamination, with plastic, um, that that's that's seems overwhelming. I'm glad there are people getting it straight so they can set a good example and maybe reduce the cost to do that. I was also wondering um, when you, when it comes to what you want on your food, what about the difference between uh, what about the concern with putting um, for those who 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 want to eat organic or to the extent possible eat organic. Um, what about the contamination of, of uh, food from pesticide-treated food? And especially when it comes to, I, 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 I can't believe that Michigan has let apples become, well, with all the apples that we produce here, um, I can't believe that we are not doing more about uh, dealing with the fact that apples have now surpassed all other fruits and vegetables for what to avoid when it comes to, or what to buy, what, what to choose organic if you can. In other words, it's one of the most contaminated, one of the worst uh, offenders of, of, of uh, pesticide-treated foods now. Um, so anyway, that being said, what about the contamination of foodstuffs from insecticide? Well, I think first I have to admit 
considerable ignorance when it comes to the fate of pesticides in um, the composting process. I know that the composting process actually has been proven effective at breaking down some, some pesticides fairly s significantly, um, but I can't tell you which and when and how. Uh, to me, uh, more power to you. Um, go for the organic thing. I think, I think that the uh, organic farming and, and gardening um, business world is, 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 is very small compared to conventional ag uh, agriculture, but because of exponential growth, won't always be that way. Um, so your support of that, I think, is wonderful. Um, my own, my own viewpoint is um, that I, I personally would not choose to throw out the, the baby with the bathwater um, in that I think that recovery of all organic resources has, has uh, appropriate benefit and I would continue to do so because I think that's the primary problem to deal with. Um, but I can understand why other people might not. Any other questions? That's more. Your, thank you for coming. This was really interesting um, and for the work you do. Your previous slide, can you go back to that? You had some bullet points, and I didn't know if that was what the... the um, was that the James Beard one? I guess it wasn't. Yeah. So are these items that they're focused on or that... like that's, what is? That's what they're focused on. And, and honestly... Um, I was so gratified to hear the executive director of the JBS Foundation speak that I wholesale took his slide. Oh. <laughs> because, because I think these are really important things for the food. I found it very heartening, the food, the food industry, high-end food industry was focusing on this. So for the fourth one down, the initial success with <coughs> antibiotics in meat, do they mean using meat without antibiotics? Absolutely. OK. Absolutely. That, I just want to make yep. sure that I was understanding that correctly. Yeah. OK. Yep. Organic, Perfect. Organic beef without antibiotics, which I do think is a huge issue. A big issue, yeah. yeah. OK. Yep. Thanks. That was just my question, was to go over those bu um, the different bullet points. But you, you know, something that I forgot to mention that I think is really important is that, is that in a culture of celebrity, whether you like it or not, we have it. It turns out that chefs lobbying in Congress have been very successful. And so one of the reasons that this policy advocacy policy boot camp bullet is there is that one of the things that they're doing at the JBF Foundation is to, um, is to encourage chefs who might show up on the Food Network to use their celebrity to move things in a positive direction. And that was one of the pieces that I, I mean, because let's face it, you know, those of us working in zero waste, we got a lot, we got a lot of social profile. <laughs> Not. <laughs> Hi, thank Hi. you uh, again for being here. Um, yep. I was just wondering when it comes to, like you were talking about the anaerobic digester versus composting, um, both of those have the element of heating and temperature. Um, so I, I guess we kind of have a huge issue here in Michigan where half the year is uh, cold. So what, what would you suggest when it comes to the environmental in impact of heating these facilities? For, for instance, I go to Michigan State. We have two anaerobic digesters that go down to one in the winter because it costs so much energy to um, heat the, you know, that process. What, you know, what would you say to the other environmental impacts of uh, food waste management? Well, so first of all, I would, I would say to you, and I know a little bit about the MSU digester, that um, you can expect that a full-scale digester always, always produces more heat through the digestion process than it's going to consume. The MSU digester is, by nature, an academic and demonstration approach. And because it doesn't get to that level, um, to, in order to keep the bugs working well, they have to keep it heated. So um, in general, what you could expect is that um, in a suitably large facility with economies of scale that you need, um, it would have no problem keeping itself heated even in northern, northern, northern Alberta up near Edmonton, which is much colder than here. So, and then the, the heat and composting is all self-generated. That You would never add any heat. Um, the only thing you do end up using energy for is if you're, if you're moving air around to control, uh, control moisture, control temperature. Um, there is a little bit of a carbon footprint with that. 
I would say, if, if by extension one of your questions is how do you, how do you sort of incentivize uh, the use of um, anaerobic digestion to sort of low carbon fuel, I would say we got to have utility reform. And you can't make this thing work unless you value the carbon in the atmosphere. And if you only are willing to purchase anaerobically digest, uh, digested and produced um, natural gas at a wholesale rate, and I don't know if those of you in the room know the difference between retail and wholesale rates, it's never going to pencil out and be positive. Um, we have to have a little bit more enlightened utility process that way. But you know, I, I will make a little bit of a political statement here, which is as long as it, the uh, regulators of the utilities are former big utility company executives. That ain't going to happen. And so in order to make that change, uh, people are going to have to act locally and, and insist that a little bit more progressive approach um, be taken. Any other questions? I'm sorry. Anyone else? So I got a, I got a question or two for you folks. Um, how do you see this fitting? How do you see food waste recovery fitting in um, with sort of some of the, you know, um, some of the emerging businesses here? I'm, and I'm thinking specifically breweries. I'm thinking. Um, uh, I'm thinking, you know, innovative um, uh, food production systems and whatnot. Are there folks from here? Are there folks in this room that are that are part of that industry? Well, yeah. you've got to make the math work. Mm -hmm. So the business, and including investors, nobody's going to lend you the billions or millions of dollars to find solutions mm -hmm. if you don't have the, the volumes and the ability to make a, you know, positive cash flow. Mm -hmm. And when you look at whether the consumer or the businesses and you look at, you know, the logistics cost of redirecting the disposition from landfill, you know, they have a hard time justifying the added increase. Mm -hmm. So you really, you got a, a yin and a yang working here. So you can make the investments, you can find the solutions, but unless you have the volumes to make the, the money, you're not going to make those investments. You're not going to be able to do that as well as then the consumer, those businesses, if they've got, you know, trying to maximize profitability when you've got the lowest landfill cost in the country here, or one of them, you know, we're, we're all just talking. Uh, yeah. But Dwayne, you know more about it than I do. Um, there, there is a uh, Dwayne. Dwayne, Dwayne is here. For those of you who don't know, from the MDEQ, and uh, he's been a long time, a long time supporter of um, organics recovery and recycling in the state. And he's been part of the group that's working on a, a regulatory package that is uh, supported by the governor, that they're trying to get through the legislature to uh, provide a little bit. Uh, a little bit more incentive um, for recovery of all sorts of materials, including food waste. Right. So uh, right now there's a proposed uh, bill in where they're going to add $4.44 per ton surcharge on all solid waste that goes into the landfills. So hopefully that'll get our disposal costs up a little bit, even though it sounds like a lot of money because currently you're only paying $0.36 cents a ton, but to go to four forty-four, you know, I think they figure it's about a dollar and a quarter per person per year is, is really what that's going to come down to when we look at, you know, residentially. So if we can get that money to help fund all these changes we're talking about in the Part 115 statute, oversight, planning grants, recycling grants, anything I think we can do to get the disposal cost up is only going to help. Well, another thing is doing a pay as you throw. So there's all kinds of things you can do. You can do landfill bans, you know, 
So there's many, many things we can do. Daniel. Thank you. are things that don't necessarily make good meals, like Twinkies and cakes and so on and so forth. Uh, has, have you given much thought to that, kind of how that fits in with, uh, with the food waste paradigm? Yeah, and, and, and there's really some, there's some really good work going on. Um, the Harvard Food Waste Reduction Project has been focused a lot on that. Uh, refed. Uh, after the work that we did on the report that we did has focused on changing policy around donation rules, uh, Good Samaritan rules, <coughs> other things that make it, make it more difficult to sue people donating food that might have made someone sick, stuff like that. But fundamentally, Daniel brings up a key point, which is both, both because of waste profiles, spoilage profiles, and other things, um, Donated food waste skews heavily towards carbohydrates. And it turns out that the Twinkies and the cakes are an issue, but an inordinate amount of it is bread as well. Um, and so consequently, um, you know, in many cases, some of the most valuable donations to food pantries are dollars, because what they then do is they use those dollars to supplement um, for protein sources and fresh, fresh, fresh fruit and vegetable sources to go with the other material that has been donated. And um, one of the things that we had a major fight in, in terms of the refed project, was um, everybody likes to use a unit of a meal saved. And, and they tend to use that rather crudely by taking um, some number that says you get a pound and a half of food per meal. And if you're going to save, um, three tons of material, that's uh, 9,000. That's 9,000 pounds, and so consequently that's, let's see, do the math, that's uh, 5,000 meals or something. And it's actually not. And so one of the pieces that we had to even within our organization and, and within the supporters of ReFed that were a number of foundations that were focused primarily on food waste, food prevention, um, we sort of get everybody thinking a little differently about that and not use those crude measures. And that, that kind of comes from this, you know, let's, let's actually be real about how we talk about food and food donation and not try to disincentivize it, but also recognize that it's not the panacea it necessarily seems to be when people talk about, you know, five tons of food donated in Ann Arbor or Grand Rapids or something like that. I think we have time for one more question, if it's a short one. It's somebody in the back. Oh, all the way in the back. <laughs> I'll walk towards you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks for your presentation. I'm curious if you have any information as far as, from the farming end of things, what the typical yield of crops are for a farmer who's using more of an organic-based compost versus a man-made fertilizer and how we can use that, that piece of the puzzle to start to um, enhance this conversation, right? I guess because we're looking at the tipping fees versus product I, sales here. I'm curious I don't, if you know anything about that. And I've been looking for five years. Have you? Okay. Yeah. And, and, it's, and actually, that, so that's a really good, that's a really good, one of the things that um, those of us in this business and that includes you all, um, I think would really benefit from is some systematic economic studies of those kinds of questions. Because there's a, there's a tremendous amount of resources devoted in this country to tracking agricultural statistics. But they are conventional agricultural statistics that are aimed at figuring out how much corn is grown in Iowa. And, 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 don't, and don't get me wrong, they are, they are excellent statistics, they're well-founded, they are almost always right. But the problem is parsing out the kind of question you just asked is almost impossible because we don't track that. We don't, and, and, and there's these, these USDA systems that are in place to track very specific kinds of, kinds of data. And, and so the organic stuff either doesn't get tracked or falls in a much larger bucket of things that you can't 
parse it out. Um, so no, unfortunately I don't. And, I, and I've sort of, you know, we've got this tremendous resource at MSU and the Ag School and, you know, they have a very popular urban gardening program and, and sustainable ag kinds of things and there's people working there that are really tremendous people. And every time I talk to them, it's sort of, they're like, oh yeah, I wish I had some of that data too. And um, so if anybody, let me know. If anybody, if anybody finds it, it would be fabulous because yeah, I think you're asking the right question. Okay, thank you very much, JV. Thanks a lot, it's a lot of fun. Thank <laughs> you.